Greetings to my fellow Rhodesians and subscribers to my YouTube channel. This is John Fransale. One of the interesting things about the series Fighting Men of Rhodesia is that I keep learning new things about our history that I never knew before. In this episode, we learn about a unit in the BSAP called the GSU, or General Service Unit. Excuse my ignorance, but I'd never heard of them before until I met a Canadian from Ontario called Doug Towler. Doug served in the GSU at the height of the war, and today he shares his story with us. Doug, well, thanks for joining me all the way from Canada. Um, <laughs> how did you end up in Rhodesia in the first place? I worked at Crown Cork and Seal Company in Toronto. They make bottle caps and aerosol cans. The young fellow who was our quality controller on our shift, he had a sister, a girlfriend, and his mother were in England. And he said to me, how would you and I like to go there, visit with them, and we'll work our way around the European continent because Crown Cork had plants in virtually every major country, including Rhodesia, believe it or not. So we made this plan. We set money aside, and this was in 1964. And we actually sailed, the two of us sailed from Montreal on the Empress of England, heading for Liverpool. So we all met up on the, on the play games deck, on the upper deck where they played all the games. And two young fellows on the boat were from Rhodesia. One was called Phil Hodgkinson. He was a PTC uh, contract, not a contractor, technician, I should say, in the Gatuma area. And the other fellow was called Mike Heppel. And his parents farmed tobacco on the between Marewa and Matoko. Their farm was situated. Mike had received a message whilst they were working their way across Canada to say his father was ill. Would he please come home? Which was the reason that we were all on the boat together. I had no intention of going to Africa, John. I didn't even know where Rhodesia was if my life depended on it. I got talking to these guys, and the two of them told me about this fabulous little country. So I said, okay, I'll make up my mind when I get to England. We stayed in the old VC, the old Overseas Visitors Club in London, and I said to this fellow, Bob, I said, you know, I'd like to go and see this place, Rhodesia. I got nothing better to do in my life. And... I probably will never get another chance. I said, would you mind? He says, no, that's fine, Doug. He says, I can drift around Europe and, and I'll go back to Canada. So he did. I bought a ticket to South Africa there to get to Rhodesia. And I had to travel from Las Palmas to Madeira, where I spent the Christmas in 1964. I had the most fabulous Christmas I've ever had in my life, honestly. I got on the Cape Town Castle in Madeira just after December 27th, 1964. <laughs> just, out of, just out of interest, um, I was 10 years old, so it would have been 1966. I also took the um, Southern Cross, I think it was, and we sailed from Cape Town to Southampton. And we also stopped at Madeira. Mm -hmm. and Las Palmas. Uh, is, Going that up. The is that where the volcano is happening at the moment, Las yeah, Palmas? correct. It's, John, the island the volcano is on. When, we, when I was there in 64, there was only three islands that there was public inhabitation on. The other four islands, the smaller ones, there was no tourist hotels. It's not like it is today right. where it's packed with, with Scandinavian tourists and that. So. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Everything was centered around Las Palmas in those days. So yeah. you would have been northbound. I was yeah. on Union Castle ship going southbound. Madeira <laughs> is where Cristiano Ronaldo was born years after uh, I was there. Okay. That's yeah, his home. Yeah. I mean, to be on a ship like that, sailing down over the equator, that's a, a lifetime adventure. Yeah, you know, yeah. you don't, <laughs> it's not something you just sort of laugh off and say, oh, well, it is. Crossing the equator was super. Yeah. Um, anyway, I'm sorry I interrupted you. No, so no, no, not at all. <laughs> Absolutely not, John. So anyway, there was a couple on this ship, John. One, this fellow Terry Ailes, he was going to Swaziland to open a business. He loaned me the money to get the train ticket to get me to Rhodesia. Because after I paid for my boat ticket, I virtually had maybe a pound, 
two pounds left to my name in total. <laughs> and I spent most of the trip with the crew on the ship because they took a liking to me and said, oh, shame, poor Dougie and all this. We'll look after him. So I got spoiled by, by living with the crew virtually in the whole trip. Anyway, we get to Cape Town and the Afrikaners being the way they were in those days, they said, well, where do you think you're going? And I said, well, I know these two people in Rhodesia. And they said, but how do you think you're going to get there? I said, well, I got money for a train ticket. And they said, oh, really? I said, yes. So, of course, in those days, the SAR, the SAR, the South African Railways fellow, came on the ship and sold the tickets to go to Durban, Rhodesia, wherever you wanted to go. So he'd come on the ship with the lighter. He's on there and all the people go by and, and I'm the last one that they want to deal with because they're looking at me with all this rucksack of stinking clothing and no money and, you know, scruffy. So anyway, I, I let them all go. I go up to the guy and said, how much is it going to cost me to go to Salisbury? And he said, well, he says it'll be, I think it was something, almost 10 pounds or something, John, that I had to pay. And this, the fellow had given me 12 pounds in, in money to cover the cost. So I said, yeah, okay, I can afford that. So I'll buy a ticket. So I, I bought the, the ticket there and then. And that night, I slept in the Siemens Mission, the old one, on the shores of the harbor of Cape Town. The next day, I go to Cape Town Station, get on the train. Now, in those days, I don't know if you were old enough to remember, they called that train the Soot and Cinder Express yeah. because you had electric, then you changed over to steam, then you went to diesel, and then the part of the way you went back to steam again. And it was only when you got to the Rhodesian changeover in Haveron that you actually had full diesel all the way. Yeah. So I got on that train. I loved it. I mean, who'd ever, who's in wild Africa and you're going through all the countryside and everything. It was an adventure. And I mean, I'd never seen black people in Toronto, John. I mean, there was hardly, there was a one or two from the Caribbean back in the 60s, but you didn't see Indians. You didn't see Pakistani people. You didn't see mixed race people. I mean, this was a whole new world for me to step foot in. So anyway, we go all the way through. We get to Plum Tree on, now this would have been John, January 24, 1965. We arrive at Plum Tree at 11.45, 23.45 at night. And the customs and immigration come on from the Rhodesian side. And I'm sitting in the third class coach upright on the seat and myself and two other people. And he comes to me and he says, and uh, who are you? Where do you think you're going? So I said, well, here's my passport. I've got a one-way ticket to Salisbury, and I know two people in Rhodesia. So I gave them the names of Mike, Mike Kaplan and uh, Phil Hodgkinson. So he says, well, that doesn't mean anything to us. He said, tell me about your background. So I started telling him I worked for Crown Cork. I traveled through North Africa and, and Europe to get here. So the next thing, the one guy in immigration, he says, hold on. He says, I know somebody that works at Crown Cork. There's a fellow in Salisbury. He's got this Welcome to Rhodesia Association. Let's give him a call. So lo and behold, they phoned Mike Heppel, or Mike, Mike Driver was his name, Michael Driver. They phoned him at 10 to 12 at night, got him out of bed and told him, I'm here. I'd work for Crown Cork in Toronto. Would, would he care to sponsor me in? Because they weren't going to wake the other two up. They didn't know how to get hold of them. He agreed to it. So the next morning, 7.30, the train pulls into Salisbury. Everybody gets off. I get off the coach, and I start walking down the platform. I don't know anybody there, and I'd never seen a train station like Salisbury train station. So this fellow comes to me. He's nicely dressed in a suit and tie, and he says, would you be Doug Towler? And I said, yes. He says, oh, I'm, <laughs> I'm Michael Driver. He says, you worked at Crown Cork, did you not? I said, yes, I did in Toronto. He says, oh, he says, I think I might have something for you. He said, come with me. We're going to sponsor you into the, into the country. He said, I run the Welcome to Rhodesia Association for Immigrants. I said, oh, that's nice. Thank you very much. Took me to his home in the Avenues area of Salisbury. Introduced me to his mother. He had a younger sister there. And his brother, John, had been with Mike Hoare in the Congo. He was one of the mercenaries in the Congo. His This guy's brother, Mike's brother, his Patty was his name. So they get me settled in. And what his mother did was go through the cupboards. Her husband was flying commercially in the mid one of the, 
Qatar Airways or one of that crowd in the Mideast somewhere. He was on contract. So what, what Mike's mother did was go through all the men's cupboards to see if she could find clothing to fit me, which was nice for her because I only had this pile of junk in my rucksack, you see. So anyway, I settled into the home. And then they used to take me, the Patty and his pals who'd been in the with Mike Hoare, they had brought back three baby chimps with them when they pulled out of the Congo. And the Rhodesian government told them they could keep them in the country, provided they were kept in a proper pet store and looked after by somebody to take them home. But these guys, three days a week, <laughs> John, they would take me and we go have a coffee and a bacon sandwich downtown. But then we go and play with the chimps for a few hours in the in the pet store. I was supposed to be out looking for work, but I never got around to it. So eventually, here's another coincidence for you. This, this has got to be a touch of God, John, seriously. When I worked in Toronto at Crown Cork and Seal, we had dismantled a coating machine. Now, a coater takes metal tin plate and puts size on it first for the ink to adhere. And then if that tin plate's going to be used for something like a bottle cap, they have to put a special urethane coating on it. So you, there's no food poisoning or anything involved. Now, we had dismantled this unit. I'd worked on Saturdays and Sundays getting overtime, helping the guy who was the operator put it into boxes, number it, and all the rest of it. We didn't know where Salisbury was. We didn't have the faintest clue. It just said going to Crown Cork and Seal, PTY, Limited, something, some address, Harari, or not Harari, Salisbury, Rhodesia. So we're all looking at the thing, where the hell is this place? We've never heard of it before. Lo and behold, this is the very plant that Mike Drivers is the general manager of, the CEO. So he says to me, Doug, he says, what did you do at Crown? So I told him I was a loader. I was the guy who loaded the sheets onto the presses before they started going through the printing process. So he said, well, he says, you can't do that in Rhodesia. That's a reserved job, he said, for an African. He says, you can't afford to live on the pay that that, that job would be earning. But he says, I'll tell you what. He said, if you want to come to the plant at, in the afternoons, the plant stopped at 430. He says, I'll pick you up or the pressman will come and pick you up. And we'll drive you out there and you can help him reassemble that coder. Because he said, we don't, we've never had one of these machines in our life before. We don't know how it goes together. We got the instructions, but it doesn't make sense to us. And he said, you took it apart. I said, yes, I did. So he says, oh, you've got a job. So this is what they did. And, and really, we should be keeping this on the QT. But I went out there every afternoon and I worked from 4 p.m. or 4.30 p.m. to about 8 at night with the with the regular pressman, the guy who operated the printing press. And we reassembled the machine and they paid me out of petty cash. So this is going along fine, Mike. I've got money. I can pay my round of beers and everything when I go out with the mercenary guys. So, you know, things were looking up. So come the, I think it was around the 8th or 9th of March in 1965. Mike says to me, you know, Doug, he says, we all do military service in this country. I think if you want to stay here, you should go down and see what your status is, where you stand as far as doing military service. So I said, OK, I mean, I'd never had been in the Navy, but I'd, I'd never had anything to do with it. Not even as cadets at school did I go to. So I went down to it was an old. One of those old colonial type buildings on the avenues running south from Jameson Street, uh, second floor, and it was called the Office of Emergency Manpower Training or Emergency Manpower Development. So I go up to the office and the fellow says to me, do you intend to stay here? And I said, yeah, I like the country. I said, I'm, I'm going to go and see a fellow down in Gatuma one of these days and see if a bug is here. He says, take this card. It was a little, the card was about three by five. They put my name on it said that I'd registered, and he gave me a number, 1011. I didn't know what it meant. I had the faintest clue. And John, not a single person in there said to me, did you do any previous military training? Have you ever been near a military base in your life? Not a single person asked the question. So fine, I took the card with me. I went, eventually, I traveled down to Gatuma. I met Phil, and I met his father. His father was the compound manager for Patchway Gold Mine, which is west of Gatuma. So his father says, I might be able to fix you up with a job here. I said, oh, really? He says, have you ever worked in a mine? I said, I've been to Inco, the nickel mine in Canada as a school kid, but I wouldn't work in that place. It was filthy. 
and it's pitch dark. I mean, it's a horrible place to visit. So he says, well, this is different. This is a gold mine. I said, okay, what are you offering me? He says, well, I'll make a phone call and see if they've got any openings. It won't be here. He said, it'll be at the main mine. So I said, sure, I don't mind. I'm being curious, George, I'll take a chance, you know. So sure enough, they phoned and yeah, there was an opening on the stores, on the on the ground level for the ma major stores department. The fellow who ran it was called Ted Edwards. His wife, Madge, was the bookkeeper. And his clerk was called Vic Winterbottom. And Vic Winterbottom was the coach and manager of the soccer team for the Cammon Motor Mine. So anyway, I go and work in the mine. John, without a word of a lie, I come from Toronto, which was 600,000 people which is barely 600 people. It was the finest education I could have ever had for an introduction to a country. I saw the best and the worst of the Afrikaners, the English, the colored people. I'd never, never worked or been near colored people before. I saw Pakistanis, Indians there running the stores and that. I mean, and I had what, five, six different tribes of Africans working on the mine. I mean, it was, it was fantastic. So I worked in stores for six months and an opening came up for working underground as a sampler surveyor. I went and did the test. They passed me and said, sure, you can go. And I worked underground until such time as they started flooding the mine, which was 1967. Um, it was getting dangerous, John, because in World War II, they, they brought in people to do the mining of the gold. They hadn't left safety pillars or crown pillars anywhere. They just followed a seam of gold and didn't care where the thing went. So, of course, the upper levels, probably three down to about 10, were totally unsafe to work in. When we got earth tremors, that place lost tons and tons of equipment, John, because everything rolled down the, the tracks towards the, the shaft and hit the shaft timbers and away they went. I mean, there was all kinds of locos, cocoa pans, everything went down there. So yeah, with towards the end, when the earth tremors started getting more and more, it was getting dangerous. But I worked level 40 to 46. I was a mile and a quarter underground. I loved it. I absolutely loved it, John, without a word of a lie. I took my, my gang of three. I had a fellow called Numtanga. He was from that tribe up in the north east. Right in the corner were Malawi, Mozambique, and Rose, Rhodesia squeezed together. He came from a little tribe up there. He couldn't speak any, nobody could communicate with the guy. Uh, my boss boy was called Dixon. And these guys were a dream to work with because they knew the mine inside out. I just had to sort of pay attention to what they said and, and follow the rules and that. You know, I loved it. Absolutely loved it. So anyway, I met my wife. Um, we went to a party that neither one of us knew any soul in. And I heard her accent. She heard mine. Uh, she thought I was from the States. And she'd been traveling in Europe. And I'd been traveling in Europe, but in different places during the same year. So we got talking to one another at this party. And I said, when I marry you, and she laughed. She said, you're not going to marry me. I said, oh, yeah, we will. And sure enough, a year later, we got married. <laughs> And um, I worked for Edgar's. I got a job with Edgar Stores as a trainee manager. I uh, loved the job. Uh, I worked my way up. I got to run the largest sales house in Bulawayo. And we did fantastic business. I could tell you a separate book about the stories that went on that store, John, honestly. Totally away from military and that. And I worked my way up in Edgar's to distributions manager. I went up to be the merchandise control manager. Anyway. Come August 1975, so now this is 10 years and about eight months after I got this little 10 by the three by five cards with 1011, I get this letter in the mail and it says, you are requested, didn't say you must, it said you are requested to report to Major Robert Dupree, training officer, 9th Battalion, Brady Barracks on the 1st of September. So I thought, oh, okay, this looks interesting. So I went, I, they told you on the list, John, what you should buy, what you should prepare yourself for to bring with you, your own personal things, which I did. My wife drove me there, dropped me off at the gate. I said, where's, where's Major Dupree? Oh, up that way. So they point, I walk up, knock on his door. I said, sir, I have a card here and a letter I'm supposed to report to you. So he says, oh, he says, where are you from? I said, well, originally I'm from Canada. I said, but I've had this card for almost over 10 years. Now somebody sent me this letter. 
Well, he says, come on in. So he looked at the card, took it from me, didn't say a word. And he says, okay. He says, we're going on a bushcraft course for non-commissioned officers and corporals and sergeants, etc." He said, I want you to come with it because I want to see what skills you have. So I thought, oh, this will be interesting. So I went down to the stores. I drew what I was told to draw out for myself, told me where to go to help them load the trucks and that. And away we go. Now, this was when I first ran into Corporal Fani Boshoff, who was going to be my number one on the mortar for a long time. He was on this course. So that night we're all sitting around the fire and the guys have had, we've had our food and we had, we were allowed at one beer that at a, per day. So he says, Hey guys, I want to introduce you to my Can new Canadian friend here. This is Towley. And I said, well, it's property Doug Towler, sir. He says, well, you, to me, you're Towley. He said, what did you do in the Canadian army? You, you were, you did national service. I said, no, he didn't. He says, what do you mean? I said, there's no national service in Canada, sir. It never has been. He says, were you, were you in the military? Did you do cadets or anything? I said, no, not a thing. He says, have you ever handled a gun? I said, oh, yeah, I own three rifles, which I did. I had a Marlin 3030, a long, long rifle Winchester 22, and an over-under, 22 and a 14-gauge under. Well, I used to go hunting when I was in my late teens. So I knew how to handle a firearm. He says, there's something wrong here. He said, you have a card which you gave me that says that you have military service under your belt. I said, well, nobody asked me, sir. Oh, well, there's a major mistake been made here. I said, I would appear so. What am I supposed to do? He says, well, I can't send you back to Bulawayo. We're out here for this training. He says, you can stay and be my gopher. He said, you just do what I tell you to do. And he said, the fellow over there is called Obi. He was the medic. Obi Oboholser. Anyway, I ended up working between him and Major Duke. I enjoyed the camp. They let me do all the things that the guys went on. He let me fire an FN. And I mean, I, I got a kick out of the thing. I, hell, this is good. Get back after the 30 days. Major Duke had already made calls. And he said, listen, he says, Tally, he says, I've contacted the BSAP. He said, they have a semi-military unit, which he said, I'm going to send you to so you can get some grounding. He said, you will come back to me, but you're going to have to spend a few months with them. So I said, okay. I had no idea, John, exactly what he's talking about or what this all entailed. So I finished my commitment and went home. As usual, mail comes within 10 days. There's the next call up in the mail. And it's a road depot. I gave the name of the chief inspector I was to report to and be there in such and such a time and bring this, this, and this with you. So, 1st of November, I go down to Commie Road Depot, and I got in there. Now, this was a different ball of wax, John, because there was spit and polish. Like, there was real hard discipline in the spit and polish. The two people there was, one's just passed away. John Craney was his name, and the other one was Vanda Merva. They were both ex-Army, regular Army drill instructors, but they've been seconded to, the, to get the GSU guys fucked up and into shape and that. So... You get the sh usual shouting and nonsense going on. So I, I went through the stuff and we slept in the depot barracks. Uh, we had a cot there. It, was, it wasn't our stretchers. We had a proper cot in the depot barracks. I was taught how to make the bed like a military style bed, you know, the corners and everything. Never done that before. And I went through the drill and I actually loved it. I actually appreciated the discipline of my life, I think, at that time and the fact that Vandemerva and, and Graney were teaching me things that I hadn't even the faintest clue. I'd learned how to do a funeral drill like to perfection in with them. And the all the close order change of the of the arms, the guard and all that. I, I love that. I laughed it up. So anyway, this goes on for two weeks. We're then sent out to Matopos to do some practical field training. We go out there. The very first order shouted out is D boss. And I thought, what the hell is this? And I see the guys go, no, come on, Doug, jump over the truck. So I jumped over the truck. Yeah, lo and behold, there was loose gravel right underneath me. Boom, my left ankle hit the gravel, stepped over on the side. Uh-oh, problem. Now I start feeling the pain. So 
they didn't have a medic with them, but they had guys who were trained in first aid. So they, I, that held my ankle in place. And what they did was they propped my foot up and they got somebody to drive me back to, to barracks, uh, to um, Commie Road in a Land Rover. So the medic there actually saw it. He took off my boot. He wrapped up my ankle and everything. And he said, look, if you just manage light duties for the next four days, he said, you'll be fine. You'll be able to complete the course. So that's all I did. I did almost pencil pushing for the rest of the, the four days. So then they they, I'm ready to go. This is now a week later. And they said, we're sending you down to Rutinga. I didn't have a clue where Rutinga was. So I said, okay. So next convoy was going that way. I jump on with my kit and away I go. Roll up at Rutinga. Check in that afternoon. Next morning, they say to me, you're going on a rail patrol. I said, oh, that sounds interesting. What's that? It was one of those little jiggers, the motorized jigger, John, with the four sides, the sides and the, and the windows front and back and the cutout sides. There's myself. There's three colored chaps. One colored chap was driving and the other two were on the lookout for tears or anything along the side of the rail. Rail patrol, we head towards Guello up that line. And we go, it's about 15 kilometers. Things are fine. It's sunny. We can still see. As we lift the cart off, we start, we lifted the cart off to the side and then manually walked up and down to see if there's any signs of tears being around there or not. As it was getting dark, turned the cart around, decided to come back. Now, you know yourself in Africa, the sun just goes straight down, drops like a, like a rock, right? So it's really getting dark fast. Now, along the side of the rail lines, and you've seen them all over Africa, the workers have metal rondavels. Some have adobe, some have grass or, or stick rondavels, wooden rondavels. And this is where they stay and they keep their equipment for what, what they're working on the rail line, correct? So these people in these huts did, and they're coming out to go to the bathroom to cook food and what have you. And these colored guys started taking pot shots because when the door opened, they saw light that they panicked and they'd let off a round or two. And the poor guy driving, he's screaming at them. No, 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 no. You're killing innocent people. Just cool it. You know, and we eventually got back to the main base in, in uh, Rutinga. I just went to the OC, John, and I said, you can put me in DB, but I'm not going out with those guys ever again. So the next day, John, they sent me out on a patrol. We went to those uh, villages south and east of, of Rutenga in the TTL there. Now, you know, the Majibas and the kids would drive goats and cattle all over the place to, ro to ruin the tracks and everything for you. So we, we went through there. We, we tried our best to, to figure out who had been there and what was going on. But it was such a mess in each village and they knew we were coming. So it was a waste of time. But the problem was, John, when I got back in those days, you and your mate were supposed to go for a shower and each one check each other's body for ticks. The person who checked me didn't check closely enough. The next day, I came down with, with Lyme's disease, tick bite fever. So, and, and this really whacked me this this whacked me hard because you know you know from the recounts you've heard john people get delirious you sweat like a pig you're, you're tossing and turning your limbs are like they're flopping like like rubber dolls and that so fortunately i went through this for three days and sweating and going through all the nonsense on lying on the cot and one of the medics heard of a south african crew who were working east of rutenga and he went down and asked the medical crew, because they had a big fancy field hospital and everything with them, what do you have? And they said, we've got tetracycline. They just brought it in the country. There was none available in Rhodesia. The South Africans brought it in with them. So I was, I got this put into me. Boy, did it work, John. Within a couple of days, I was back up on my feet and, and able to do uh, about 90% duties. I wasn't 100%, but I couldn't believe how quick this stuff worked on me. So... The other thing that blew me away when we were down there, John, we did a patrol east of the camp along the river. Now, you remember the four Jacks and a Jill, the singing group? Yeah. They had a summer home along that river 
which the tares had gone in and not only looted, but they tried to burn it down. So it was it was still situated there. We went beyond that. And there was a, a gathering there, uh, an opening. There was SAP people. There was SADF people there. And there was a couple of Rhodesian uh, BSAP people there. There was some dead tears lying. There'd been a contact earlier in the morning. So we came across this. And the guys, they, they knew me by then, my background. So the, the one fellow in the group, he says, hey, Dougie, he says, do you know that your people are doing this? I said, doing what? What are you talking about? He says, come here. And on two of the dead terrorists, there was backpacks, there was clothing, and there was footwear that said gift of the people of Canada. There was a Canadian flag sewn on to the, the, the item. Well, these guys were upset. I said, hey, I, said, I mean, I don't like it any more than you do. And uh, it, it upset me a bit, John, to think that, you know, what was going on here while I was out there. But Hey, it was what it was. Anyway, the next camp I did with GSU, I was in Bite Bridge. We were camped behind the main rail station. Our job was to go out and do the rail line. We would start from 30 Ks out and a two man team would do a 5K or 6K stretch and then walk out to the main highway and wait to be picked up. And we started about 5.30 in the morning. I had the top end of that stretch, the 30 to the 25 K marker. I took, the, it was my turn to do the rail line. So I got the higher part. The fellow with me was down on the dirt road. I'm walking down a huge embankment, John. It's almost like a causeway of stone. And I see this movement out of my eye, my left eye in the bush. So I stopped dead and I signaled to the guy with me to, to cool it, just stand still. Lo and behold, John, a cheetah came out of the bush, up the embankment, stood on the on the middle of the track, would be maybe 150 meters ahead of me, stood there staring at me. I just went dead still because I thought, well, if I move, she'll run. If I don't move, we'll see what she does. And, and the guy was staying still down the path. He didn't move. And she sat there and looked and looked. And the next thing I could just barely hear, chip, chip. And it's the kits in the in the bush. Lo and behold, she's off down the side, grabs one, comes back up, sits on the track, looks at me again, holding this thing in its mouth, turns around and goes down the west side of the embankment and off into the bush, going towards the highway side of the of the rail track. I thought, this is crazy. She came back, didn't even stop to look at me. The second time, she went straight over the track, down, down the east side, went back in the bush, picked up the second kit, brought it out stopped, looked at me, and she just sort of stared for a long time, took off, and away she went. That was the most amazing thing in my life. I mean, John, to this day, I can remember it so vividly. And it just blew my mind that they trust me to, you know, they, they could have taken off. But she just stood there as long as I didn't move. She was happy. So we took off and did our, our um, the rest of our patrol and, and went back to base. The thing about Bite Bridge, John, you know, the munitions trains used to come through at night. They'd load them up in Petersburg about 11, 10, say 22, 2300 at night. John, we got no sleep whatsoever all the time we were there because those things, they were making such a, you could hear the diesel straining. You could hear the, the wheels, the steel wheels screaking against the track as, as they're coming down. They were totally overloaded. I mean, there was no question about it that those things were way overloaded. And when they came to the bridge and actually started coming across the bridge, the creaking was unbelievable. And then eventually, of course, they get on our side and they start up the other way. The terrorists would have heard them 20 miles away. John, there's no question they didn't know there was a train coming at that hour because the racket was just out of this world. So we put up with that virtually every of the 30 days we were there and we're sleeping there. We had to put up with it every single night. It never failed. And Honestly, when you saw the stuff that they were lugging through, I mean, you couldn't believe it that they were bringing so much stuff in. And, of course, they had the flat cars with the AA guns on the front and the guys with the MAGs and the sandbag cars and everything to detonate any mines that were on the track. So, yeah, it was quite a quite a thing. To, it was worth staying up and losing the sleep just to see the performance of this train coming through, you know. So after that, the... I did the next two camps I did with GSU, John, I was on the bridges at, I did one on the New Anetsi River 
uh, which was parallel to the main highway. And we did one on the Booby River just after they had the flood. That time when the when the Booby Hotel flooded and that, I was I was about a week after that took place that I was on that bridge. The one bridge John knew and Etsy was a was a we loved it. One of the guys in the unit in the GS Union was this was a sub chef at the Monomatapa Hotel in Salisbury. And he arranged, I don't know how he got the message to the to the boys in the hotel. He arranged for them to 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 box up the leftover food at the night after they had a special banquet, and they'd take it to Swift, and they'd tell Swift, "We will meet you at this milepost on the road," and we'd walk out the two kilometers, and sure enough, the Swift truck would talk, and here's these two or three cartons full of all this lovely food. John, I I went into that site. I was about 151 pounds. I came home 195 pounds, literally. My wife didn't recognize me when I got home because, I mean, we were living like kings down there. This was unbelievable. And this guy thought nothing of it. To him, it was he was quite enjoying this. He, he thought this was, was a beautiful thing to do to, to help the guys out, give them good food. So we didn't touch our rats or anything. We lived off everything that came down from the hotels. So that was, that was my basic GSU experiences. Um, didn't get into any firefights or anything with them. I was close. Oh, the other thing I saw, John, you remember the South African uh, Air Force came in with the, I think it's the Pumas, and I don't think they brought a Super Free Lawn in at the time. I think it was basically a Puma. But the one time we were on patrol, we came to this hard road, this this tarred road, and the, the Puma was sitting there. And the South Africans were around. They were talking to each other. And we came over and said, oh, gee, nice, nice plane and all the rest of it. So the one says, the one fellow, he says, where are you from? You're not local. He says, you got you got Ford accent. I said, well, I'm from Canada originally. He says, whereabouts? I said, Toronto. He says, do you want me to show you how we can fly this plane to Toronto? I said, you got to be serious. And he took me in and he turned on his GPS and his navigation set. And he actually plotted out a route, John, without a word of a lie, all the way up the edge of Africa, through the parts of Europe that were still friendly to South Africa, across to to Iceland, and then down to Labrador, into Quebec, and into Toronto. I just said, are you crazy? He said, no, we could do that. He said, where, we, where I pinpoint, he says, is where we can refuel, the places that allow us to buy fuel and carry on. I was just, that just flabbergasted me, totally. I mean, that was, we're talking 70s, John, the when this was shown, not today stuff. So, yeah, I was, I, that just flipped me out when I saw that. Anyway, I finished the GSU. So I left that unit. That would have been, I finished up there September of 1976. Next call-up papers, a few days into, into October. Report back to Major Dupe. I thought, oh, good, I'm going to go back and see Dupe because he and I got along well. So sure enough, I go back. He says, Tally, he says, have you ever heard of a mortar? I said, yeah, I know what a mortar is, sir. He says, have you ever touched one? I said, no. He says, I'm going to teach you. He says, there's a five-day mortar course, and you're going on it. He says, you're going to be a good mortarman when I'm finished with you. And this is how I met Fonny Boshoff because Fonny was one of the instructors on this course. So we did the course, and then after the course was finished, they took us up to, there's a Army exercise ground south of Thornhill Air Base. You don't go right to the air base. You turn off before you actually get to the turnoff for Thornhill. There's a lot of trees, and it's a wooded area, but much of the ground, John, it's dug out like like you would dig out a basement for a house or a swimming pool. And what they've done is thrown old logs and, and not rubbish so much, but brush vegetation back into these holes. So we were given the task of clearing out the holes in teams and building a fortification in each one of these four major pit holes. So that's fine. We get there. We they I got fun teamed up with Fonny because he knew me from doing the mortar course. So we start working together and lo and behold, it starts raining late in the afternoon. So Fonny says to me, Dougie, he says, I don't fancy getting soaked out here tonight. He says, let's say we crawl in the back of the, of the supplies truck. So when we get in the truck, he says to me, have you got anything warm to drink? I says, well, my wife always packs. Remember the jars of coffee, John, the liquid coffee? Did you ever see that? 
it was foul tasting stuff, but it, when you were desperate, you would take it. So my wife had put that in my, my backpack and Fonny's wife had put a small bottle of brandy in his, just one of the little tiny nip bottles. Eh? So he says, I got some goon guy juice. He says, what do you got? I said, well, I got this dark coffee. He says, well, let's put the two together. We slept like babies that night, John. The rest of the poor buggers got soaked to the skin. There's a button. And of course, the brandy had helped us sleep through everything, you know. And I don't know whether the officers actually knew what had taken place, but they didn't, they didn't discipline us. They actually sort of avoided us, if you want to put it that way. They, they didn't come near Fonny and I for the rest of the day. Anyway, we finished that exercise, did the fortifications, everybody's happy. So the next thing, an officer, an Air Force officer comes in with one of the ninth bat officers, and he goes to Fonny and he says, we are doing an exercise, we want you to partake in it. Who do you want to join you? You can have your choice. It's going to be involving a mortar. We want you to pick who you want. He says, well, I've trained this guy here from Canada. He says, he can come with me. And he says, oh, there's there's Garth from Wanky. He's pretty good. He'll be my number three. So, okay, fine. Off we go. They had a, there was a wall built up, John. It was about 18 feet, maybe just under six meters high. It was railway sleepers, straight up. Okay. Behind it was a circle on the ground. No cross or anything, just a circle. Off to the side was an Alouette chopper. What they told us to do was, put the mortar in the carry bag, the duffel bag, <clears throat> the bipod and the, the base plate all had to go. We were to jump on the chopper. The pilot would go up, he would circle around, and then he would drop us behind this wall, give us so many seconds to set everything up. And then we were to follow him to where he flew and he would hover over the spot that we were to drop the mortar into. And it was all done by coordinates. So I thought, hell, this is nice. I've never been a chopper in my life before. So we jump in. Fonny was in the middle seat facing back. The pilot's on the one side. I'm on the outside. The only thing keeping me in there was that safety belt, the harness that comes over the side. Because I'm hanging out. I'm loving this. I'm hanging out the side. The fellow with the base plate was in the back next to the tech where somebody like Beaver Shaw would be sitting. He was sitting on the opposite side with, with the base plate at his feet so we get up zip around way we come down drop off fast as anything set up funny had the sights done and everything i did the bipod the young fella he had the base plate in place boom we're we're ready with maybe 30 seconds not even so we radio the chopper guy say hey we're good to go get away with it so he took off he stopped and Fonny started working the sights and he called the guy and he said, I've got it. He says, I know exactly where you are. Fellow says, okay, fire two rounds when you're ready. So I being the fellow handed me the round. I primed it down the tube. Away we went. The guy said, all we heard on the radio was, oh my God, you're perfect. And Fonny says, what do you mean? He says, you're right down. He says, you couldn't get it square centered if you even tried. He says, it was perfect. Put the second one exactly there. So funny did. He was out maybe four inches on the second one from where the first one had, had hit the target. So we're, we couldn't figure out what was going on. But, John, what we weren't told was we were up against a team from the RAR and a team from the RLI. They were doing the exact same competition. And it was only later in the evening, as we're heading back to where the camp was in the bush there, that we found out that we'd beaten them, that Fonny put this thing. He was chuffed. Like, Fonny was like six foot off the ground. <laughs> I mean, this was the height of his career, I think, you know, to beat the RLI and the RIR. And then January 77, I get called up, and then I went to to uh, Villas. That was the first time for me in Villas. Martins Nodi was our lieutenant. Um, he was a character. He, he was an absolute character. He knew my late father-in-law because his car sale business in Bulawayo, he had dealt, my father-in-law was a service manager for John Love Motors in Bulawayo. So Martins would take his vehicles to him, knowing my father-in-law would give him a perfect job on the car that he'd, he, you know, he'd always have a perfectly good car when it came back. So <clears throat> we had James Taylor was a sergeant. Uh, Barry Tatton was the CSM. 
Kevin McGregor was a sergeant. Andy Barrington was it was a sergeant. Uh, I'm trying to think of who else. Those were the those were the four main ones, I think. And and Martins, of course. And I went to Villas, uh, completely new setup. So we went down there and we got settled in and we would always take eight boxes of mortars with us in the truck. Now, all these mortars were ex-French Indochina mortars. They all had the original French writing on the front, you know, Army de France, um, Dien Bien Phu, uh, France de Indochina, and the dates and everything. It was all still on the boxes. They worked. They worked like a charm. I mean, you know, they were good mortars. So we took eight of them with us, although most of the time, without a word of a lie, John, we only had, we barely had enough people with us to man four of those mortars. We struggled because the call-ups were getting smaller and smaller all the time. People weren't reporting. So we would go and set up six to eight of them in the pits, or we would set up six and leave two in the pit, only actually physically man four of them completely. So Fonny and I would be in number four mortar. Number one mortar was closest to the rail line and two came next. And then three was just before the command bunker. And then we would be number four mortar over to the left of the command bunker. <clears throat> and it, I enjoyed it. I, I had to say, say I actually enjoyed Villas. It was a camaraderie ship. Uh, we had some good times down there. The one time we took some colored chaps with us. They were sent down to train. The original building that was the customs house and the main, there was like a lounge in there where you could have a drink and stuff. And there was single rooms for people who were trapped there overnight. They could stay in a room down the hall. Well, at the back of that was a big pit where they had originally intended putting a swimming pool in. But when the war started, they turned this into a form of a bomb shelter to run into if things got bad. And it was covered over with tarps and and railway sleepers and drums, and concrete blocks, all of this. Well, you didn't go in there, John, for the simple reason that the snakes had been in there and they loved to inhabit. That was their home. So we have these colored guys come down with us, right? We're playing volleyball, which is the National Army sport. You know, you're aware of that. So in the middle of the game, the ball bounces down this, the opening, the side opening into this pit. So we just say to one of the colored guys, oh, XA, just get down there and get the ball out for us, Clay. Well, John, he came out of there. He was white as a ghost, literally. He said, XA, there's a hissing item down there, and I'm not coming down there. You're, you get the ball. I'm not going down there anymore. And we were killing ourselves laughing. But in actual fact, there was a snake down there because when our guys went down to try and get the ball, down, they found a pole, a stick. They went down there and started bashing the thing, grabbed the ball and ran out the hill. But we weren't aware that the, nobody had ever told us that the snakes were, were active down there until these colored guys come. So, oh yeah, we had fun with them. John, the other thing was, you know, on our night sites, on those sighting poles, we have a little uh, green night sight. It's like a little, it looks like a little view master thing, but it's got a green cross in it. And you set that on your sighting pole to get the direction for where you're going to fire if you're called upon to fire like the one that Fonny and I had was set for the diesel local workshops on the Malvernia side um, each one of our pits had a different sighting place that they were targeted for so <clears throat> these things are up at night and of course once it gets dark all you see is it looks like a, a huge firefly but in a shape of a cross well, they sent the color guy out to do a night patrol of the perimeter of the, the camp. And he said, there's spooks out there. I'm not doing that, sir. He says, ghosts up there looking at me. He says, I can't go out there. He says, I'm condemned if they see me. And we went and said, what are you talking about? And he took us to the pole. Well, we just about wet ourselves laughing. So when the daylight came, we said, we'll show you. And we went and showed him the next day. Still wouldn't go out. Once it got dark, that guy disappeared. We never saw him outside. He went to his, his stretcher. He didn't come back. That was it. And, oh, we had all kinds of adventures with these guys. They're a world of their own, John. Honestly, they're an absolute dream to work with. But they're in a world of their own, totally. So the one time Martins, the first time Martins went down there, which was this first camp, he, it was his first time in a bush with us. He'd been in the bush before, but not with our unit. And at the back of Villas, there was that long row of single rooms. 
And most of the officers used to camp in there and the guys would camp at the main building or just behind it. So one afternoon, it was hot as Hades down there, John. And Martins went and lay. There was a mattress in one of the rooms. So he picked that room to sleep in and he took all his clothes off. But he had his his side weapon, his nine mil Browning was out on the, the mattress next to him. Two of the sergeants went and got a thunder flash. They went up to the front door of this room and they put the thunder flash there. And then we all took off and hid behind the buildings. This thing went off. Martins came running out of there. He's got the he's got the revolver in his hand. He's ready to fire. Not a stitch of clothing on. And he's running up and down looking. What the hell is going on? Are we being attacked? Somebody better come and save us. What? The, what where's my gear? What's good? <laughs> we just killed ourselves laughing and we wouldn't for the rest of that camp. Nobody let Martins live that, that event down about coming out of there with no gear on. We got stonked. Um, the one time it was on a Friday afternoon. It wasn't this camp it was the next one down the second one in 77. We got stonked from the other <laughs> side. They got, they used to get liquored up on a Friday on the other side, the Fred's and the Zanla. So the one, <laughs> The one Fred decides he's going to take pot shots at us through the fence. Now, the fence, John, was a, just a wire mesh fence, like the white square, the square that the farmers use. And it stretched the border. And then the, the brush had grown up on both sides of that fence. So we could see them moving on their side if you got close enough and they could actually see us. So you had to be careful when you got beyond the main part of the camp that you didn't get in the spot where they could pick you off if they decide to take a pot shot against you. So this one, I'd probably a Freddy started taking pot shots through the fence at us just randomly. So that was fine, except he hit something in our kitchen. And I think I'm trying to think of it. Well, it wasn't a pan. It was something was high up over where the stove was. He shot at an angle and it went through the window, which was not there, was non-existent, and it hit this item. And of course, the thing came down and caused a clutter. So we we fired a couple of rounds, started a bit of a punch up, which we weren't expecting, but we were all safe. Not, nothing happened to us. Um, the major event that took place down there, which was the bad one, was in January 1978. Oh, sorry, before I get on to June 1977, we left Brady and some bright spark in Brady Q stores forgot to put in our night sights. They put the box in with the sighting unit, left the night sights out. So we get to, to VS, we set everything up, no night sights. Well, that's no good to us. If we have to fire after dark, we better we have need something to aim at. So they radio back. Brady apologized. We'll get it down to you by ear. It'll be a Hooters airstrip. Okay, fine. They tell us it's there today. It's arrived. Four of us go in a vehicle, go in the, have you ever seen the building there, John? Have you seen that building at, at Hooters at the grass airstrip? It's a long gated building, the like the admin building. And on one end was a bar had been built. And the other end was a couple of cubicles like you'd find in a restaurant. And then the paperwork and everything was done at the back in the corner area. But it was like a, almost like a gourd shape, John. Anyway, we roll up there. We see a DAC parked on runway. Don't think anything of it. Go in, ask the guy at the counter. We're here for our, in the corner, John, is sitting Peter Walls in his camel outfit. Ian Smith in his old farm outfit. You know, the, the wide hat he wore and the jacket and the, and the khaki trousers. Two female RWS people and two aide de comps. So we're we're talking to the guy. We don't we just sort of look and look back. We don't didn't want to intrude. It's not our business. The next thing, the aide de comp comes over and says to the guy at the bar, give these guys a beer. We said, Hey, we're on duty. We're not supposed to be drinking. No, no. Prime Minister says you can have a beer on him. He wants to thank you for your service. Without a word of a lie, John. He turned around, stood up and said, fellas, I want to thank each one of you individually for your service to the country. The people are proud of you to keep up the fight. He says, it's tremendous. We were just about blown away. Bought our beers, had our beers, got in the vehicle, went back. To this day, John, I would ask any person, which leader of which country can you think of 
would be in the front lines and buy you a beer when you're in the middle of the battle. You know, that's Ian Smith. That's how different he was. You know. So anyway, that was that was in, in June of 77. <clears throat> the rest of the year was reasonably quiet. We got stonked once in the in the base of the radio tower. Never exploded. Just went into the sand base of the radio tower and stuck there. It might still be there to the day they closed the place off. I don't know. Um, but we always gave as good as we got. And we found out after the war, when the other side came across, that they knew which unit was stationed at Villa Salazar by the way they responded to what took place from their side of the, the fence. Uh, second bat they hated, because second bat used to pound them with meningi shells, like they would really <laughs> give it to them. Um, RA knew would stand out to them, and, and ninth bat, they said, we don't know how few you guys were. We could have overrun you without even batting an eyelid. But we knew that if we gave it to you, you'd give it to us back again. So we, we sort of respected you for that. Um, the crunch time, John, came in, in 78 on the way home, January 31st. We were supposed to have been relieved at Villas on the 26th of January by the fifth bat. They couldn't get enough people in the intake to answer the call up. So the army scrambled around and they got the RAR. The RAR came in, changed with us. And one of the soldiers on the RAR gave me a, a, a camel flop, floppy hat, the soft type. He says, sir, he says, you've got light skin and red hair. He says, you're going to get burnt badly going up that road. He says, you better put this on. When we got through the ambush, John, that was the only single item on the whole back of that truck that was not burnt or scorched was that camel hat. So anyway, we took off. We were late. It's 31st of January. We get down to the Chicken Beds EPV. We turn north. We're going down the road about 15 Ks above the PV. And we see fun, um, Andy Barrington was sitting on the front right of the truck facing out to the left side. Behind him was Kevin Knusen. He's a Lance Corporal. We called him Kawinji because he was always whining. Behind him came Josie Alpium, who was killed in the contact. On my side, Peter Smith, the amateur golfer, was sitting next to me. And then came me. And there was a fellow from C Company on my left-hand side. Fonny Boshoff was driving the truck. I went to turn to Andy and said, do you want a cigarette? And at the same time, we both saw a scotch cart coming down the road towards us on the other side with two young aths, maybe nine, ten-ish. And all of a sudden, John, they came to a stop and they're both their heads turned to the left. And we thought something funnier. So, you know, the noise of those old Bedfords. I mean, you, you, you have to have a tank shell to hear yourself think over them. So both Andy and I were slamming on the hood of the truck to, have, to get Fonny to slow down if he could hear us. Well, we carried on. He must have heard something because he, the truck slowed down a bit slower, but not, not a lot. We traveled a bit more, maybe 50, 60 meters, John. And the next thing we hear, whoosh, whoosh. And there's two RPG sevens went over the top of the truck and exploded in the bush to the west of us. Now, at the time, I had lit two cigarettes and I had turned and I was actually facing Andy. It was about, he hadn't turned his body yet. But I was calling out to them, and I was about less than two meters away. I had the cigarette in my mouth. I'd lit them, and I was just about to hand it to Andy. The next RPG-7 came in, hit Andy, hit the TR-48 that was on his left side. He had wedged it down the seat. You know where the end of the seat was? He put the TR-48 there. He was sitting tight to that. The thing hit the TR-48 and Andy's left side. Now, because of Andy taking that blast, the rest of us on the truck, although we were had the crap put into us of shrap, Peter Smith next to me had his back peppered like a red and white polka dot pattern. He was blown over the side of the truck. Fawny took a lot of shrapnel through the back of the cab window into his neck and his shoulders and that. Andy was killed. Kevin Knusen next to him had been leaning against Andy. He's half snoozing off. He got blown off the truck, literally. Josie Alpium, who was the next in line on Andy's side, he went over the side of the truck to, to shoot the tears in the ditch, and he got killed as he went over the side. Me, in 60 feet, straight up on the truck, 
And here's the strange part, John. As I'm going up, I didn't, I'm not, I, in those days, I wasn't a, a connected to a church or a, any connection with God. And all I shouted out was, and they heard the guys in the ditch heard me. Oh, Jesus, save me. That's all I said on my way up in the air. I looked down on the truck. I saw, I saw LPM going over the side and get shot. I saw the, the sandbags and, and the kit and everything on fire. It had gone through the sides of the truck. So I go up and I start coming down. Now, by this time, there's only Andy's body and me on this truck. And Andy's dead. I mean, they can't do anything for Andy because of the rocket. I land face down and I pulled myself by my fingers to the back of the truck. The base of the truck, John, in those days, it was uh, conveyor belting and sandbags. That was our mine protection. You remember those days. And I pulled myself to the very back of the truck. The vehicle immediately behind us was the supplies truck driven by Ian Murray, Colin Murray's brother. Now, as I got to the edge of the truck, I'm looking down, I can see the gravel on the road. And I, in my mind, even though my head's going ding, 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 and it's like a huge explosion going on in my head, I'm thinking, hell, if I pull myself down, I'm going to smash into that. That's all. I thought, well, I got to get off this truck because it's on fire. As I looked up, I see Ian Murray slumping over in the cab. Twice I saw him jump, it was like his body twitched. The truck came to a grinding halt because he'd taken his foot off the accelerator and it just locked into gear and froze. So I pulled myself over, I hit the gravel, and the guys on my right side who were in the ditch, that they were firing at the tears who were on the left side over the rise of the hill. I'm lying on the ground there and I can hear them shouting to me, Dougie roll, Dougie roll. And I couldn't because my water bottle and my Dixie were still in my belt on my back and I couldn't turn my body. Eventually they climbed out of the ditch amongst the fire and dragged my body in, and pulled me into the ditch and then pulled me further back after that. But I was propped up against a tree eventually when they got me moved back. I was non compass mentis. I was really out of it totally. And they had a young Indian medic. We never had a medic come with us to Villas and the whole time we went there, John, but this time we had an Indian medic with us. He propped me up and he's feeling over my body. He's trying to figure out where he can, I was in total shock. He's trying to figure out where to put a drip in. Eventually in my right toe, and it started to take, Major Dennis Payne came over to where the medic was treating me. And he looked over and I could see, I remember his face. I remember, uh, James Taylor's face and Barry Tatton's face. And I, all I said to him, John, was, oh, Jay. Well, he just burst into laughter. He says, come on, guys, let's kill the terrorist. Doug's fine. He's got his humor. That's all I need to know. And that was it. And he, he was just astounded that it, he says, how can the guy recover like that? And that's, that's got to be God, John. I mean, there's no other answer. Um, what happened after that was they took us, the army responded to the call from the guys in the radio. They came down from Terezi, Buffalo Range. They brought an old Bedford with a flat back in and they put us on stretchers and laying face up and drove us down about three or four kilometers down the road on the, on the west side was a strip, a grass landing strip for a plane. They drove us to there and um, police reserve air wing fellow with a big Cessna had pulled in there. Now, of the tears, John, there was two Majibas, four regular tears. One of the tears was shot, so he they they wanted to take him in with us. The three tears of the Majibas all headed towards the Chimani Mani range, but they were eventually caught because it, I remember we were very ticked that a judge in Salisbury allowed the two Majibas off with a tap on the wrist, uh, even though they'd been fully participants in this thing. So anyway, the guy in the police air wing plane, he says to them, I take the Rhodesian guys in my plane first. He said, that one over there, he said, meaning the terror, he says, he waits till the end. That's my condition. They said, okay, fine. We're not going to argue with it. So they loaded myself and Fonny in first side by side. We, we were taken up the buff range and then to the, they stripped my clothing. Everything had burnt was my, my hair was gone, burnt down to a center, my hard hat, my peapot had split in half. The helmet had held it across my head. 
So the back half, I still have a, a scar right in there. The back half was still in place. The front half was, who knows, it was blown off somewhere. The nurses st stripped all my clothing, made me sit on that metal table, and they were trying to do x-rays to see what was, what was actually damaged. Um, shrapnel through my ankles <laughs> without my right arm triggering off the sensors because of the shrapnel in there. And the Swiss have the best sensors. Their, their machines picked it up every single time we went through Zurich Airport. Um, so, yeah, we were in the hospital uh, about eight days. They booked us on an Air Rhodesia flight from uh, Terezi back to Bulawayo. Uh, they took out seats in the back of the plane and fit six of us. The ones who had not been injured the worst were moved out earlier in the week. But the, the six of us who were really badly banged up and had a lot of shrap and, and damage done to us, we were the last ones to leave the Terezi Hospital. So we went back to, got back to uh, Bulawayo Airport. The Army had every, uh, I stayed there probably another two and a half weeks. And the funny part was my wife came to me one day. I was in there maybe five, six days. My wife came to me one day and she says, this arrived in the mail for you. I said, what is it? She says, your call-up papers. So I said, just leave them here. So she left them with me, and I had them on the side of the bed. An officer came down from Brady to see how I'm doing. You know how they used to come around and visit you to cheer you up. I said, uh, I believe you want these, sir. He says, what are they? I said, my color papers. And I said, I'm in no shape to go fight any war right now. He said, I said, you take these, and when I'm better, I'll, I'll let you know. He says, oh, yeah, sure, Doug. He says, I don't blame you for doing that. So he just tacked, tore them up right there in front of me, just threw them in a garbage can. He says, they never existed. <laughs> I said, good enough. Um, the one incident I didn't tell you about, 23rd of January, a stray mortar. Now, this wasn't provoked. We had done nothing to do to bring this on. Somebody on the other side fired a mortar round. In pit number three, which was manned by Lance Corporal Kevin Knusson, he had Sergeant Ian Watts from C Company and Rifleman Trevor, 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 I can't remember his name. Sorry. Anyway, they were in the pit with Kawinji learning how to operate a, a static mortar position. The mortar hit the front of the circle of the pit. The shrapnel split in half. Kawinji was standing to, he would have been to the left side of the mortar position. The two of them who were hit were at the back of the pit. The shrapnel went straight past Kevin's face and took took the two of them at their neck and head level. Gone. He was he was he was in he was just horrible. He was he just screamed on the radio. We've been hit, we've been hit. So Fani Boshoff and I were in pit number four. We went through the trench and ran over to see what had happened. And it was a mess, John. I mean, you don't you don't ever forget a sight like that when you when you see damage done like that. And <clears throat> The guys came, the sergeants came running out of the command bunker and went to, to uh, pit number three as well to see what they could do for him. And it was the day after that, the Major Dennis Payne was sent down from Bulawayo to take over running the camp force. That's why he was with us when we were ambushed on the way home on January 31st. Um, I went back, uh, I did two months off. I went back in August of 19... 78. That was my next time back after the ambush. I actually came over to overseas on a trip overseas uh, with Ursula and my wife and her father. We came to see my parents here and, and that. But I was well enough to go back and do full duties. And then in September 1979, John, they closed villas off totally. They put huge pancakes all the way around it. And we were transferred to work with the engineers down on Crook's Corner Ridge. Uh, they were redoing the minefield and there'd been game driven through there. The tears had pushed the game in front of them and then try and come through the country that way. Uh, just little mistakes in that and the mines had gone off. So they had to be reset and rebuilt. <clears throat> I, we had a super time down there with the engineers. Um, the one thing that happened that was quite funny, <clears throat> you know, the size of pythons in Africa. Well, we were about two kilometers north of where our base camp was, and they were working down near the river edge, 
doing this this uh, mine laying and resetting new ones. So one of the aphs wanted to go to the bathroom, so he walked away from the work site and went back up to the bridge, the bridge or the bush, I should say, and did his business. Coming back, there was this huge python which blended in with the with the sort of dead brush all around it, and it was wrapped halfway around a tree. It was taking the scales off its off its back. So the tail was maybe three meters on one side of the tree, and the front part was two and a half to three meters on the other side of the tree. And this thing scratched itself. This poor aft, John, stepped on the tail without realizing he thought it was a piece of wood on the ground. So he just stepped on it. Well, of course, the front of the the front of the python came up like a rocket and it zipped around, and now it's trying to undo itself off this tree that had been scratching itself. This guy took off, John. I think he must have run two kilometers at least before he stopped running. He's just screaming, yoga, 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 and he's off like a rocket. Of course, the guys who, they're down there laying the mines, and they can hear the snores. What the hell's going on up there, guys? You know. And then one of them ran up, and we told him what happened. He says, oh, he says, I'll go find him. Don't worry about it. He says, you guys just carry on protecting us. Oh, it was happened so fast. I mean, we were in the in the hogs sitting right at the top of them to protect them if if the BTR from the Frolimo came on the other side, right? Because they would drive down the road and threaten our guys. They thought it was a big joke to bring the BTR down along the road and get right close to the river and threaten the guys who were working down there doing the minefield. So we would bring the hogs as close to the river as we could safely do just to show them we were prepared to give you a go. But yeah, it was unreal. And the other thing was one of the African sappers was a bit cheeky this is when we're now late 79 so the countries so this guy was cheeky he didn't like the the white captain who was in charge telling him anything so the <laughs> engineers being engineers they went out in the bush you remember those huge big black spiders john they're like humongous size one uh they're 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 bigger than a hunting spider i'd never seen spiders this big you get them in the dense bush anyway the engineers went out and found one of these things and they euthanized it. They didn't kill it. They just sort of knocked it out for a bit. They tied fishing line around the thing where this aft went. And this aft was regular as clockwork. He went about 6.30 every night. You can set your watch, but he went a trip to the bog. So what they did was they put this huge spider down the bog on the, the fishing line, and then they hid away behind a partition. So they waited. And he, sure enough, he came, and they waited until he was down there. And they yanked this spider up as fast as they could. Well, it touched his legs, of course, on the way coming up. He went, he went berserk, John. I mean, he went, he was quiet as a mouse after that. Didn't hear a word out of the guy after that for the rest of the camp. He was like a little church mouse, honestly. And they were killing us. How to get back at this guy to get him to calm down. And this is what they did.